Hi everyone, uh, this is Zoe. I'm a curriculum product manager here at Codecademy and today we are doing another Codecademy live event. Um, myself and Jamie are going to be walking through another part of the visualized data with Python skill path. Um, Jamie, how about you introduce yourself because it's your first time. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie. I'm a new associate curriculum developer at Codecademy. Uh, I'm very excited to be joining everyone here. Um, and I'll be here to answer any questions and code along with Zoe um, with the data, uh, Python data visualization course. Yeah. So um, I'm going to share my screen and take us through the content that we will be doing today. So one moment as I get that set up. Okay. So I'm excited because today we're going to be talking about how to select data visualizations for your work. So at this point, we've gone through how to create line graphs in Matplotlib, how to create other types of plots like bar charts, pie charts. And what we're going to be talking about today is uh, we're going to go over this article, how to select a meeting visualization. And then after that, we're going to test our knowledge of plotting different types of data in this lesson slash project that we have called Recreate Graphs using Matplotlib. Uh, I'm going to be screen sharing over here, um, walking us through. As Jamie mentioned, he and I are going to pair program on the lesson slash project that we have after this. And we'd love to hear from you in the comments section. What are your questions about data visualizations? Um, we would love to hear if you have ideas for uh, answers to the project. You know, we might walk through one together and then we'll turn and, and see if anyone in the comments section has the answer that we're looking for. And we're gonna wrap up uh, around two o'clock today. So hopefully we'll get through, um, we'll definitely get through the article and we'll see how much of the lesson that we're going to go through as well. Cool. So um, again, we're gonna start with this article, how to select a meaningful visualization. I think this is really important because again, at this point you have understood, you have learned how to create different visualizations. And now comes the moment where you're putting it into practice, right? And when you put it into practice, you have to consider which visualization matches the data that you have on hand. It's gonna be you making that choice. Um, so in order to help you with that process, this article explains how you would go about making a decision about that. So basically, when you're considering what you want to build, you wanna think about two things. The first is the question that you want to answer with your chart. And the second is the type of data that you want to visualize. So depending on your answers to either of these two questions, that should determine what chart you're going to use. Um, so we have this diagram below where we've taken different matplotlib visualizations that you've already seen, you've already built at this point, and assigned them to a couple of different categories. And so these categories can again help you answer those questions and help guide you to the chart that you would want to make. So the four types of diagrams that we have, this diagram diagrams are composition, oops, down here, composition charts, distribution charts, relationship charts, and comparison charts. So I'm gonna uh, walk us through each of the four of these. Jamie and I have found examples of each of these types of charts. So we're gonna show those examples and discuss Again, uh, what kind of data you would use for each type of chart and when you might wanna use one chart over another. Um, so Jamie, I'm gonna show the charts that you pulled up and maybe you can talk to us about each one of them. So first off, we're gonna talk about composition charts. And with composition charts, you have the question, the question that could lead you to choosing this chart, I should say the focusing question is, what are some parts of the whole? What is the data made of? Um, so data sets that work well in this case are data pertaining to probabilities, portions, and percentages. 
uh, charts in this category illustrate different data components uh, and the percentages as part of the whole. So you can see here that we have a pie chart, right? So we're saying that this data is composed of different types of percentages of data within that. And we can illustrate that by assigning those percentages different color values. And so you can quickly see and see what may be the majority of your data and what be, may be the minority of your data. Um, so Jamie, I believe, ooh, that's not the one, this is mm -hmm. the one that you selected. So tell me a little bit about this visualization. Of course. Uh, so as Zoe said, um, we use composition charts when, like often when we have proportions or we're dealing with percentages. So in this pie chart, um, it's talking about US energy, energy consumption. I just found it on the internet. Um, it was just a real life example. So all the sections of the pie chart show the different types of energy sources that the US uses. And then the interesting thing I thought about that uh, this chart showed is you, like most of the time we think of composition charts, we think of pie charts but really you can use any shape. So if you notice on this chart, um, it shows like a pie chart and then it also shows the percentages within renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So solar, wind, geothermal, hydroelectric, um, and I see that says biomass. Um, so with, um, with uh, composition charts, uh, you can use like different shapes. Uh, just one of the things you have to be careful of is like the specific thing you choose. Normally, it's normally you choose a pie chart or a bar chart uh, for composition charts. Um, you have to, you want to make sure that the percentages um, like are shown like equally with the area. Um, and what I mean by that is, you want to make sure that like the area chart that you're using does not like overemphasize uh, different different percentages. Right, because as we kind of talked about actually in the first episode of the series. While data visualizations can communicate data and increase our understanding, it's also really easy to lie with data visualization sometimes. And so you could theoretically make a pie chart look you know, slightly different in terms of the data um, if you were trying to communicate something, but it wasn't actually true. So it's always good to, um, again, make sure to check and uh, see that you're communicating things correctly. And this is gonna come up again in another type of chart that we have. All right, so the next type of chart we're gonna discuss um, uh, is a distribution chart. So data sets that work well in distribution charts are data that is in large quantities um, or have various attributes. So visualizations in this category will allow you to see patterns, the occurrences, and I think very important, clustering of data point. Does your data sort of end up kind of having, um, does it get distributed in like a certain density in a particular area? So I'm just gonna scroll back up so that we can see some basic distribution charts. So you can see these ones over here. Um, you may not be familiar with histogram charts or maybe you're still getting to it. I can't remember where we are right now but histograms are one way of showing distributions of data. So uh, very commonly also known as a bell curve. Um, so we can know that most of the data occurs between these certain areas that the average would be somewhere in the middle of this particular histogram here. Um, so Jamie also found a histogram. So why don't you tell us about this particular visualization? Uh, so this is another uh, graph that I just found online. So this one just talks about the histogram of arrivals. I imagine just like the arrivals of maybe like trains at a train station or something. Mm -hmm. um, so Zoe went over what a distribution chart uh, chart is. Um, so the reason it's good for this data is because when you look at a distribution chart, you can see the overall shape of the data. So by looking at this chart, you can kind of see what the where the mean arrival times fall. So in this chart, I would say it probably falls around four arrivals per minute. Um, so that's kind of the advantage of a distribution chart. You can see things like the mean. You can also see basically how spread out the data is. So if you look that this histogram is like right skewed, meaning that more of the data kind of skews toward the right, right of the graph, if you notice. So like between the values of six and 12, um, the data is a little more skewed than it is towards the earlier values. Um, so yeah, so it typically works well with things when you wanna look at like the frequency of um, like 
how the data is distributed. Um, so. Yeah, and I do believe, I'm not sure if it's in this particular, it doesn't look like it's in this particular path, but if you take the data science path, um, which I'm just gonna bring up really quickly so folks can see this. Um, we have a couple of courses that really dig into the relationship between stats and visualizations, um, particularly when it comes to histograms. So if we go down to this NumPy section, statistics with NumPy, um, you'll actually see histograms again in here. So you're kind of getting a bit of a, of a heads up, I'm trying to find the specific one. We had some like fun visualizations with these. Well, maybe I can't find it in particular right now. Ah, yes. So this one we can, you can see Instagram here and you can see if you have certain data that are outliers, how that impacts the distribution and specifically the mean in this case. Cool. Um, so moving right along, next uh, type of chart we're going to talk about are relationship charts. Um, so here the focusing question is how do variables relate to each other? So we want to think about more than one um, variable in this case and looking as the name suggests at the relationship between those two variables. How similar are they? How much do they diverge? So data sets that work well here are Unsurprisingly, data sets that have two or more variables that could be displayed in these charts. That could be, you know, looking at population over two different years, for example. Or, well, no, that's comparison. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. This would more be more so looking at um, something like what I'll show as the example is temperature related to ice cream sales. Um, so you're looking to see if there is a correlation, a relationship between two or more variables. So scatter plots are great for these. Um, so this is <laughs> a very fun little kid-friendly website, but it does make things really accessible. Um, so here we can see the data set. So it is uh, temperatures, Celsius, and then what the ice cream sales were that day. So if we were to take these, and plot them against um, X, Y axis, where temperature is on the X axis, sales is on the Y axis, you'll start to see that there looks to be some kind of pattern happening here. The, the um, dots tend to trend upwards when the temperature is high, sales are high. And you can actually use even a line of best fit to see. And we can, we can uh, use charts like these to also predict things in the future. We can imagine that if the temperature got any higher than this, maybe ice cream sales would increase as well. Um, so those are examples of scatter plots. Um, you know, one thing that we talk about again, to go back to how data visualizations can lie is that we've heard of this phrase, correlation does not necessarily equal causation. And this term is specifically known as a false cause fallacy. So when there is no relationship between variables despite a visible correlation, that's known as spurious correlation. And there's actually this really funny website um, that I know has made the rounds on the internet at some point. There's even a book about it now, but it's called Spurious Correlations. It's by this guy, Tyler Biden. And I, I think these are absolutely hilarious because he plus these, they look like very serious, you know, formal, data visualizations that you would see in like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, something like that. And then you look at the data sets and it's, um, God, dark, very dark. A lot of ones about people dying. What is up with you, man? Um, anyways, <laughs> let's go with the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool correlates with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. And you look at this and it's like, if you didn't know what the data set is, you'd be like, huh, there seems to be some kind of relationship here. What would that mean? Is it that suddenly people were inspired to, I don't know, like 
get drunk by the poolside and accidentally fall in because they had just watched a terrible Nicolas Cage film or a great, I don't know about people's opinions about Nicolas Cage. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so you can, you can see that a lot of these, you know, again, they trend in very similar ways. Um, but do we actually think that there's a relationship between the <laughs> per capita consumption of margarine and the divorce rate in Maine? I don't think so. Um, so I think it's important when you are using scatter plots um, and data sets that are looking at uh, relationships to think about, you know, to remember that correlation does not always equal causation. It's fine if you see that, but you can't necessarily that one thing causes the other one and, and affects the relationship. Um, and sometimes it can be just pure coincidence. Again, like some of these things, all these various correlations are just pure coincidence. So if you know you do start to see a pattern in your data, you want to think very critically uh, about whether enough, where you, whether you have enough data to suggest that there's actually a strong relationship between those variables and correlation. Um, you also may want to think about could there be other variables that are impacting that data. Um, so again, if you go back to our ice cream example, ice cream and hospital admissions for heat stroke could also possibly be in correlation. But it's not that ice cream causes hospital admissions for heat stroke, right? It's more so that temperature, as we saw, maybe would increase ice cream sales, but it could also relate to more hospital admissions. Um, and basically, if you are going to suggest there's a correlation, just really make sure your argument is watertight. Cool. Um, so the last chart type we're going to talk about are comparison charts. Um, so sort of, you know, a similar idea of working with multiple variables, but this time we want to know not what the relationship is between them um, and whether one causes the other one, but how do they actually compare to each other? So data sets that work well for this are ones, again, that have multiple variables. Um, and the visualization itself should allow a reader of that visualization to easily compare two sets of data, A versus B. Uh, so over here, we can see um, that you can have a multicolored bar chart. We can imagine that maybe this is the uh, population of a country and it could be Great Britain versus France over time, um, which could also be plotted uh, on a line graph like this and one line would, you know, be the variable for population in Great Britain, the other one would be France. So looking at some examples of multiple line graphs, as I was mentioning populations based in different countries, here we see three lines um, for one line for each continent, it looks like Africa, uh, I guess North and South America combined and Europe. On the x-axis, we have years. On the y-axis, we have population. So we can see generally there is a trend moving upwards. However, Africa is consistently below uh, the Americas and Europe in terms of population in the millions. Um, we can see another one down here about temperature in Dubai. In this case, it's comparing the minimum temperature to the maximum temperature over time in a specific year. For multiple bar charts, it's again kind of just a different choice in terms of if you'd want to do a line chart, uh, excuse me, a line graph versus a bar chart. So here, um, I want to go back down actually a little bit more. Here's another one about population. Um, but in this case, rather than looking at population over a significant number of years, let's say, I don't know how many years it was in the last one, um, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years, we only have three years in this case, but we actually have more countries that we're looking to compare to. Um, so again, looking at France versus the United Kingdom and each bar relates to a different year. So we're both able to compare population between different countries and then population across these three years per country as well. So um, that's, that's basically the idea. So if, again, you are doing your own data visualization project outside of Codecademy, which we highly recommend that you do with what you've learned to put into practice, 
you can use this article and this diagram of diagrams to help you select your next visualization. So, Jamie, any uh, comments or questions in the chat? How's the chat rolling? Oh uh, yeah, chat is going good. Awesome. Um, a lot of people are just asking questions um, and I'm making sure to stay on top to answer any of them. And I, Great. yeah, please keep asking questions um, and let us know if you have any questions about what Zoe is doing. Absolutely. And Jamie, if you're interested, you can also answer some of those questions live too. Yeah, of course. Over there. Awesome. So next thing we're going to get into will be the uh, lesson project that I, I mentioned. Um, so this comes right after this article in the path. Uh, so in this lesson project, we're imagining that you work as a high school math teacher, which Jamie, didn't you uh, do some, did you do some math teaching? Yeah, I was a uh, student teaching calculus and pre-calculus this past year. Look at that, what a coincidence. <laughs> Um, so we can imagine that, like Jamie, we were a student teacher in a uh, calculus classroom, um, and we want to display important metrics about our current class, and maybe even compare our current class to previous classes that we taught, so we can see more about patterns and trends that, you know, you just wouldn't be able to get at if you're just looking at, like, an Excel spreadsheet, when it's just, you know, tables and tables of numbers. So over here, we can see um, a couple of different graphs. These may look familiar to you, either if you've taken uh, previous courses and you've gone through the Matplotlib with visualizations, or even just from the last article we were looking at that really showcased a lot of these. Actually, I think some of them may be identical. Um, it's, okay, there we go. That zoom bar always like comes down and blocks my tabs. Okay, so let's um, let's have some audience participation. Um, can someone in the chat tell us what this first chart is trying to plot? What is it trying to communicate here? Pause a moment because I know there's a delay. So zoom in a bit may help. Any responses? No responses yet. All right. Um, JB, would you like to take a stab at it? Oh, yeah. yeah, of course. Uh, so the first chart, it's titled final, final exam averages. So it's probably talking about test scores. Um, and then the x-axis talks about different years. So this graph would just be talking about different, oh, someone did answer final oh. exam averages over time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, exactly. So that's exactly what this graph is talking about. So it's final exam averages over time. Um, and one thing you notice about this graph is it has these blue bars. And then at the top of each blue bar, it has these lines. I'm so um, glad you pointed this out. <laughs> yeah. So I believe um, last week uh, they went over this. But if you weren't there, or if you don't remember, um, these lines, they basically represent error bars. Um, so the reason, you, the reason um, some people put error bars on their graphs is because a lot of times when we're graphing, we're graphing um, data and the data might have, like there might be some uncertainty in that data. So basically you want, oh, and someone else also answered error bars in the chat. Incredible. Exactly. Um, and basically you want to show that there's like some uncertainty and that the actual, like, you know, the actual exam average might range from, you know, between 80 and 90, even though the graph will show that it's at 85. There we go. Awesome. Yeah, error bars are super helpful. And I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, cool. So there, uh, these, I believe, are all of the graphs that we are going to recreate. Um, 
So just take a moment for yourself and look at each one of them um, in your own browser and examine them. Think about which one is trying to plot, especially based off of the previous article and what we have learned about different types of graphs and where you might want to use one of them. Um, so we can talk about each one of them, I think, as we go through the lesson. So let's get started. Um, hopefully I cleared everything. Okay, good. <laughs> um, we have the, the magical powers here at Code Academy to, you know, get the answers and move through without getting blocked. So I didn't want to peek, didn't want to have anything up there. So we're going to first start with that chart that we saw and we just discussed, um, bar chart. And it's a bar chart with error, as we said. Um, and for this bar chart, the data that you're going to need to recreate it is in the lists, which we see here. Um, past year's average, years, and then error. So we'll be using these lists uh, to help build our charts. So as the comment says, we're going to make our chart below, and they've actually already called plot.show for us. So uh, as we run it, we should be able, uh, well, I guess probably we'll take a moment until we get to the final part of it show it. So, uh, Jamie, let's start with this first one. We're going to make our chart have a width of 10 and a height of 8. So what's the, the function that I call here? Uh, so I believe the function is dot figure. So it'd be mm -hmm. plt dot figure. Um, and then within the parentheses, uh, I believe it's fig size, mm -hmm. and then you want to, so that's the parameter, and you want to set it equal to, um, in parentheses, eight comma, or well, 10 comma eight, so that we have a figure of size of width 10 and height eight. Right, so the um, data for 10 for width, excuse me, gets passed in first and then height. So let's run this. Okay, do, do, do. not seeing anything yet, but, it passes the test. So let's move on to the next one. We actually get to plot the blue bars. So we wanna plot the bars which have the heights listed in past year's average. So um, maybe someone in the chat can tell us what, um, what method we need to use to get a bar chart. What is the matplotlib method for bar chart? Uh, so the method for bar chart would be, oh, I'll let someone else answer. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Eager to pair program. <laughs> and this is a good time um, to also highlight, you know, we have this get help section here in the learning environment. And if you're ever stuck on something, you can go to the forums. Um, so there's a specific forum here that if we were to just open it up in a new tab. Um, these are common questions that we've seen. So you can find answers there. Um, and if you don't have, if that question is not the one that you're looking for, you can go to the forums and post your own question. Uh, we also have concept review by uh, looking at this cheat sheet that was built for this. So you can sometimes find your answers. Ooh, sorry about that. Um, you can sometimes find your answers here in the cheat sheets. Um, you can also always get the solution if, you, if you're stuck, you just want to find it. Um, and yeah, that's kind of roughly it. So, uh, yes. Also, someone answered in the chat. Awesome. Uh, they, they said plot that bar. I think they mean plot dot bar. Um, plot dot bar. Yeah, sounds, so. yeah, sounds good. Awesome. All right. So here's where things get a little tricky. So how do we pass in the data for past year's average? 
Jamie, you want to take a stab? Uh, so if we want to pass in the data, um, so for a bar chart, we want to, oh, right. So for a bar chart, um, if we want to pass in the data, um, we are going to have to first uh, basically just set it so that we have a range of values along the x-axis. So that was like one of the common, um, or like one of the challenges with creating a bar chart in Matplotlib. Um, so if you want to first create just like the values, like you can use the range function. Okay. So you can use the range function. And then what you want to go into the range function is basically the length of the list that contains the actual values that we want to go along the x-axis. So the length of uh, past year averages in this case. Always good to spot the spelling error. All right, so then I want to go out from there and out from there again. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then we want to graph our y values. So here are the y values you want to graph are the like actual test scores. So that's in the list. Uh, that would be in the list uh, past year averages. Okay. Um, so let's go with that. All right, we've got our bar chart. I know it's super tiny, I'm so sorry. But basically we have uh, on our x-axis, again, that was the length um, of the value, so there were seven values going from zero to six in range. And then uh, our test scores uh, are getting plotted against 20, 40, 60, and 80. Ooh. And if you got stuck, um, there's a little hint too that can help you along. All right, so let's add the error bars. So um, how do we add error bars in a bar chart? Or you can see if anyone in the in the audience can share with us how we would add errors to the bar chart. Specifically of a cap size five and the heights should be corresponding to the list error that we have up here. This has been good practice for me. The last time that Marielle and I did a live stream, I'd been so in JavaScript land, I kept calling lists arrays. <laughs> We're doing list comprehensions. <laughs> I think I've finally, finally gotten myself out of that habit. Any thoughts? I don't have any answers yet answers. on the chat. Um, just uh, so like one thing, uh, if you like when you're doing your own chart, like in real life, uh, one thing you can do if you don't know how to add error bars or forget uh, the name of a function is either you can just Google it. Mm -hmm. um, so like if you just Google how to put error bars using Matplotlib, it is you'll typically find the answer within like the first couple links or yeah. even find even better find examples. Um, that show how to do it. Oh, someone someone answered in the chat. Um, awesome. So Lucia said that we'd use the keywords uh, your y er y e r r and also, yeah your <laughs> yeah. um, which is exactly right. Yeah. So we'd want to use the parameter your, and within that parameter we just set it equal to error. Okay. Uh, so we set it equal to error here because. Um, in this, we have error set equal to the list of errors. Yes. Um, and then she also said to use cap size. So mm -hmm. cap size will 
And since you want a cap size of, what is it? Length of five. size five. Uh -huh. Yeah, so you just set equal to five. Equal to five, awesome. All right, let's run it. There we go. And we got the yeah. tick mark and we can see how they've been plotted to that. Awesome, thank you to the person who responded in the chat. Okay, next one. Um, now we are going to set the axes. Um, so we're going to set the axes to go from negative 0 0.5 to 6.5 on the x axis and 70 to 95 on the y axis. So we're going to use another matplotlib function here to set our axes. And Jamie, what is that method in this case? Uh, so the method to make an axis is just plt.axis. Okay, plt.axis. And what values do we pass into that method? Um, so we want to pass the values. So if we want to go from negative 0.5 to 6.5, uh, we'll do negative 0 0.5 as the first value. Okay. Uh, so in a, in a list. Ah, in a list. That's yeah. good to point out. All right. So negative 0 0.5. Uh, then 6.5. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in the same list, correct? We yep. do 70 and then 95. Yeah. So basically it's the first x value to the next to the last x value right. and then the first uh, y value to the last y value. Awesome. All right, let's run it. OK. So I'm not seeing anything change, but where did it? I guess it did over here. Yes. All right. Um, so now we're going to create a X object using plot dot subplot. Okay. So X equals plt dot subplot method. Um, and we're going to use X to set the X axes ticks to be range length of years, uh, and then the x, excuse me, the x axis, say that five times fast. Uh, x axis labels to be the years list. Okay, so we can use the set x ticks method for the first part. And this time, since we just, again, we created that x, uh, we have an x variable there for a subplot. We're going to be calling the methods on AX now, not PLT in this case. So that is set X ticks. Um, and they said we're going to pass in range and then the length of years again here. Okay, how's that look to you, Jamie? Uh, yeah, that looks perfect. Yeah, awesome. Okay, yeah. and then we're going to use the set x ticks labels, again, calling that method on ax, x. So set x tick labels. For some reason labels is a word I always misspell. <laughs> um, and we're setting it to the value of the years list in this case. So I'm gonna run that. Ha, huh, here we go. And now we see that we have set the ticks again to the quantities that are in this years list. And we've also changed what the, the actual labels are. So they're showing the same thing as there. Great. Um, and again, a hint if you get stuck. Okay, two more to go. So now we're getting into the styling part of our visualizations, right? So we, in the data visualization process, we explore, we graph, and then we want to style. Um, so we started that styling a bit by changing the X and Y tick labels. Um, and now we're going to title and add labels to 
the um, X and Y axes, so like another step out. All right, so Jamie, what uh, do we use to get a title on this? Uh, so to get a title, uh, you'd use the dot title function. Okay, um, and that's on PLT this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, PLT this time. One step out. So PLT dot title, and that's final exam averages. And then um, we're going to call Y label with what was it? test average and X label with year. So we should see basically these labels pop up. Um, on the top and on the left and bottom of this. Really, there they are. Mm -hmm. So now we know what this plot is about. Also Again. just uh, mm -hmm. one thing I want to point out when labeling. So if you notice on this graph, uh, like you might think the titles and labels are too small or too big. You can change the size, the font size um, of the labels and, as well, and the title um, mm -hmm. just by using the font size parameter, I believe. Um, awesome. But if it's not that, you can also Google what the parameter is. Actual one is, yeah. So as Jamie mentioned earlier too, matplotlib has very thorough documentation. So you can always find what you need there. And reading and using documentation is a huge technical skill when you get into programming. It's how you unlock a lot of things. Yeah, you're, you're not expected to memorize every single you know, matplotlib function or every single function for every programming language you use. Yep. There's, a re there's a reason they make documentation. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so even when you're going through Codecademy content and you, 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 know, you feel stuck, you know, use the resources that you have, use the documentation, use the, um, the forums, cheat sheets, all of that. And yeah, I agree, Jamie. The skill is not in memorizing everything. Um, it's more about knowing where to look to find the answers. Yeah. Uh, also, someone, is it possible to like zoom in on the graph or? Uh... That is a good question. And I, <laughs> it basically gets to this point. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, it's so small. Um, Maybe yeah. you can hit the top right expand arrows just to like show it for uh -huh. a second. Ah, yeah. awesome. Right. Thank you, Jamie. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. Definitely can see things a lot better now. We can see the titles clearly. We can see the Y and X labels clearly. Our error charts. Awesome. All right, so we've got one more. Um, I'm going to zoom back out a little bit again. So our last checkpoint we have to go through is that we have to save our um, save our bar chart. So mm -hmm. Jamie, how do we save um, a bar chart so that we can access it, say, if we wanted to like create a slide presentation, if we wanted to add so an image? So it's another uh, matplotlib function. So you use PLT. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, it's dot save fig. Save fig. And then you just right. want to give it the title that you want to give your chart. Okay, and it says the title is my underscore bar underscore chart dot png in this case. Yeah, and I think if you're doing this on your own computer, you can also like, I think there's a way you can choose where you save it by like giving it a file path location, uh -huh. but I'm not certain. Um, that, yeah, that, that sounds right. I yeah. bet if we went into here and looked at save thing, Probably the general one. So file name. Hmm. You can optimize things. You can define the orientation and the paper type. Oh, this is the same thing. Well, in any case, you can dig around the documentation, 
to find out more about the properties and parameters that you can define um, in these methods. Ooh, God, there's a lot in there. All right, this is generally, I see this one back to figure it out. Cool. Uh, so, did it run it? Taking a moment to save it looks like. Ooh, endless run button. Hmm. Maybe try hmm. refreshing the page. Yeah. Um, all right, we're connected again. So not everything. Let's try running it again. There we go. As yeah. happens. That's actually a great thing to run into because I know this happens <laughs> a lot for learners. Yeah. So um, just remember if you ever encounter something like that, you can refresh the page. Your code is still saved to the container. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Cool. All right. So let's go through the next one. Um, we'll see how far we get in this because we only have a couple minutes left. Um, and I want to make sure that we kind of talk about what's going to happen in the Thursday session. So well, time is flying. Time is flying. I know. Time flies when you have fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much fun here on Code Academy Live today. I hope you're having fun. Um, I think this is like a really great project because it really gets you to think deeply again about the different types of charts. So um, let's, let's kick off with, with this one. We'll see how far we go. So in this one, we're doing a sci-fi sidebars. Um, and it displays the difference in average test scores between students who went to two different middle schools before enrolling in your high school. So you're comparing the average test score for your students. And I guess trying to see if, is there some kind of, um, you know, cause causation coming from the school that they came to in relationship to test scores. But you're also looking at and doing a comparison, right? Mm -hmm. Having a bar chart like this is one of those comparison charts that we talked about before you can compare um, these values. So the data that we need would be in the list middle school A, middle school B, and unit topics. So you can actually drill in and see how different folks performed based on what the topic is. Looks like middle school A may have had a stronger set of math teachers in this particular case. Um, it's just what I'm kind of getting from the visualization, but I'm glad to see that everyone's solid on applications. So let's, uh, let's start off by using the list to create um, bar charts here. So Jamie, how would you? So yeah, this? So, this, so this function um, came from a previous module. module. Mm -hmm. um, so like the one where it's like just introducing you how to graph on Mat mm -hmm. Matplotlib. So mm -hmm. the create X function, T is basically the number of sets of data um, so if we wanted to create the, what are we trying to uh, create the label for school A X, mm -hmm. uh, we basically want to call create X, like the function create X. And then for T, we'd put two. For W, so W is the width of the bars and their default at uh, 0 0.8. Um, I don't know, maybe like pixel, whatever the um, like parameters for that are, but it's 0 0.8. And then N is basically like if it's the first set or the second set of data. Mm -hmm. So for middle school A, it would be the first set. So we'd put N equal to one. And then for D, um, it's basically like the number of things we're plotting. So like the number of pairs of bars are. So for that one, we'd have five. All right. So we said it was two, 0 0.8. Yeah, I believe 0 0.8 is like basically the average width in that plot like, excuse yeah. me, for a bar chart. We talked about this. and. Interestingly enough, the <laughs> list comprehensions content, um, because we in the list, you can use list comprehensions um, to, and actually in this example, we're gonna use list comprehensions um, to be able to create these bar charts. So it was two, 0 
one for being the first data set. And then uh, what was five again, Jamie? Uh, so five is D like stands as like the number of pairs of uh, things we're graphing. So it'd be five. Okay. Um, yeah. And the hint also like show like writes out like what all those things are. Brilliant. Here we yeah. go. So we can drill into that. So the, exactly there are two sets of data. Generally one bar is to be a width of 0 0.8. A is the first and there are five topics that we're plotting. So I'm just going to do a little copy, copy, paste, take this and change this to school B X. And the one value that I need to change in this case is N, right? Because this is the same, we want to keep the width the same, um, but is the second data set. There's still five that we're doing. So let's run that. I think this is a really good one for us to go over um, so we can explain what that function yeah, I, does. Yeah, I was happy that we got to this one. Yeah. Cool. All right. So moving right along, create a figure of width 10 and height 8. Um, so we did this in the last one, right? So in this case, what we're doing, again, plot dot figure using big, big size, oops, wow, size parameter. And we're setting it equal to 10 comma 8 again, right? Yeah, I believe it's width of 10. Let me see what yeah, width of 10, height of 8. Always good to have a friend check your work. <laughs> um, cool. So we are going to create a set of axes um, and save them to AX. Um, so that I, I guess just they mean like we're again creating that variable AX mm -hmm. in this case and doing calling plot dot sub sub plot. My typing skills are not on today. Um, is there anything else we need to do in this one, Jamie? Uh, I don't think so. I think that's it that's for the first three. All right, let's run that. Okay, so here um, we're getting our figure. We can start to see the x and the y ticks. Brilliant. Um, and again, hit here tells you to use plot and subplot. Okay, plot a set of bars representing middle school A and a set representing middle school B next to each other on the same graph. So Jamie, how would we go about this? Um, so you'd want to create two separate bar charts. So we want to use the dot bar function this time with PLT. Okay. Um, so in step, what was it? In the first step, we created our X um, set of values for school AX and school, and school B. Mm -hmm. um, so for the first bar, you'd want school AX to be the first um, parameter. And then cool. you'd want the values associated with school X to be the second one. So that'd be the list of, what are we dealing with test scores? Yeah, so I think, right, this uh, this second list, middle school yeah. A. All right, so I'll make that the second. Okay, and then, so you said we're creating two bar charts. So I'm basically gonna copy this, yeah. paste that here and change it to school B. Mm -hmm. and will be again here, run that. Perfect. Great, there we go. So we've gotten the data in there, correct? But we maybe wanna do some, we wanna fix this up a little yeah. bit. So, so one thing I do wanna point out with uh, this chart compared to our original chart, one mm -hmm. thing you might notice right now is that there like yes. seems to be less of a difference between the values. Mm. Um, the, reason that, the reason that is, is that um, if you notice in the original chart, um, the axes go from, can't read, I think it's from 70 to 90. Mm -hmm. And then in the one we have right now, we haven't set them. So they go from zero to 100. Mm -hmm. um, so pay attention, whenever you're like looking at a graph, um, you want to like pay attention to like what the axes are showing because you might sense a bigger difference than there actually is. Yes. I think this is again, uh, an important thing and what you should be thinking about if you're ever looking at a data visualization is what is the scale that's happening, right? If, again, as Jamie was saying, if you were to look at this versus this one, we may think that there's, um, we'd have a stronger reaction. You're like, wow, it's like a really big difference in this case. 
Um, obviously also it seems like, um, you know, we know that test scores generally don't go from, well, I guess they do go from zero to 100, but what, like a C is 70, I guess? Yeah, I see a 70, unless, okay. unless it's curved. Okay, <laughs> it's been a long time since I've dealt with grading. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, so it's in this one, so I guess if you really want to dig into the comparison, we really actually kind of want to basically zoom in to this section hmm. of the graph in order to show the comparison. Um, I'm going to stop it there because we're four minutes mm -hmm. till two. Obviously, there are some more steps in here. Um, but I'm sure you'll notice a lot of these next steps are just the same steps we did in the last part, right? It's still the styling, it's adjusting the X ticks, um, mm -hmm. adding labels. Uh, this one has a legend in it, right? Because we want to know what the data set is between blue and orange. So we know what values we're comparing uh, and creating titles and saving it. So I think these are all things that's great for you folks who are here to now go and do on your own. Um, and as you'll see, there's an additional four types of charts that you can go through. So stacked bars, histograms, like we talked about earlier, pie charts, like we talked about, and ooh, line with shaded error, which we did not talk about shaded error, but that would be a great thing for you to explore. And if you don't already understand, again, how we represent error with line graphs, and we talked about it with bar charts, great thing to dig into and look at the documentation about. Um, so uh, as folks know, here at Code Academy with Code Academy Live, in addition to today's session on Tuesday, we also do a Thursday session. So this Thursday, Jamie and I will be back. Um, again, it is a pro-specific Q&A. Uh, so Jamie and I have been talking about digging into the Constellations project, which comes up next in, uh, in this section, it's one of the first cumulative projects that you get to do. Um, so it's a really, really fun one. You actually like plot a 3D uh, graph, which we haven't shown you yet. Um, I didn't know if the, I guess I thought there was gonna be maybe a picture about it, but maybe not. Uh, that's all right. But um, any case, it's a really cool project. Um, we're excited to go over it. And if you're joining us, and you're here uh, on Thursday and you were here today, uh, we can also answer any questions you might have about these additional ones um, that we didn't get through today. So um, in addition to the Thursday event, just wanna call out, we're actually doing a special um, Friday event. Uh, so we just released a new <laughs> lesson or maybe it's getting released this week on Emoji code. So emoji code is actually a programming language. Um, I guess built in emoji. I'm honestly, I don't know much about it. So I think I'm going to tune in for the live stream because I'm excited to hear more about this. I believe July is World Emoji Month, maybe, or to July 17th is Emoji Day, something like that. Any case, um, so our uh, curriculum developer, Sonny, uh, who you folks may know and have seen his stuff before. He's going to be interviewing the creator of Emoji Code and doing a demo and Q&A on Friday. So you should definitely tune in to that as well. Lots of, lots of code coming stuff happening these days. Uh, Jamie, any final words? Uh, well, I just want to say I had a lot of fun for my first live stream. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm new here at Code Academy, um, and I look forward to doing these again in the future. Um, and, I looked, and I really enjoyed um, talking with everyone on the, uh, in the chat and then also just through the camera. Absolutely. And thank you again, Jamie, for taking the time to read through and answer everyone's questions as we are going. Really appreciate that. Um, and excited to have you on the team and doing more live streams. So with that, folks, it's 2 p.m. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. And we will, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, so see you a second. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully see some of y'all on Thursday. Have a great rest of your week. Bye everyone.